Hello everybody, it's Sarah and today I didn't feel like putting on makeup so you get this barefaced beauty right here. But anyway, as you can tell from the title probably, today we have a review and that review is of Chain of Gold by Cassandra Clare which is the first book in the Last Hour series which is her newest and fourth series in the Shadowhunters universe. I will also have a bit of a discussion later in the video but we'll get to it when, when it's there, basically. So yeah. I will not tell you what the Shadowhunters universe is about and like the basics because I feel like if you clicked on this video you're probably aware what Shadowhunters is. However, if you don't know what this newest series is about, this newest series is set in Edwardian London just after the turn of the century and we follow the children of the characters from Cassandra Clare's second series which was The Infernal Devices. So of course most notably we follow Will and Tessa's children, James and Lucy, and then our third main character is Cordelia Carstairs, who of course isn't the child from anyone in the Infernal Devices, but she is related to Chem Carstairs. And we start this book as she moves to London with her family, and at the beginning of this book demon activity is kind of suspiciously low in London, so we're trying to find out why exactly that's the case. Before I get into my general review, let me just talk a little bit about whether or not I think you have to have read all of the other Shadowhunters books before you jump into this series. And I don't think you necessarily have to have read all the other books, since there are 15 books beforehand, so like that would be... that would take some time. So I don't think that it's 100% necessary to have read all the books. However, I do think to get 100% of the emotional payoff, you should have read all the other books or most of the other books, let's just say it like that. But I do think what you definitely should have read before getting into this, of course, is the Info All Devices series, because I think this might be a bit confusing without knowing the history of Will and Tessa, like what's going on exactly. As for the short story collections, I cannot remember a lot from the first two short story collections, so Tales from Shadowhunter Academy and The Bane Chronicles, but you do not necessarily have to have read all of Ghosts of the Shadow Market. I haven't read all of Ghosts of the Shadow Market before I got into this book. I only read the two short stories in which we follow two of the characters from this book. So I think you should be okay with the short story collections if you just read the short stories in which we follow, like, characters from this book. I don't think again that it's 100% necessary but I do think that it explains a lot of like background info that might make this a more enjoyable read. Now for people who have read all the Shadowhunters books and who maybe don't know yet if they want to pick up this newest edition, let me just say that at first I was hesitant as well. But I've had that since like before the release of Queen of Air and Darkness, where I feel like I'm kind of not getting too old for the Shadowhunters universe necessarily, but where I kind of moved past it. I can tell you that I enjoyed this book. I gave it four stars, so I really loved it. But five years ago, six years ago, I would definitely have given this book five stars without a doubt and I would be raving all over Twitter all the time about this book. So I can tell I've definitely moved past the Shadowhunters books at least a little bit where I do still really really enjoy them and where I do still have a big bias as well for Cassandra Clare's writing where I will ignore some of her like less well done things and just enjoy it for what it is. So I do think you should still pick it up and as I was saying since Queen of Air and Darkness I always am kind of hesitant with picking up a Cassandra Clare book beforehand. I'm like do I want to read it? Don't I want to read it? I'm not really sure. And then I pick it up and then I just fall head over heels into it right away as soon as I open the first page. So yeah, it's just really nostalgic for me and I do think this is one of her better entries into the Shadowhunter universe. I think it's definitely better than the Dark Artifices, but that might just be me because I didn't like Queen of Air and Darkness at all or the way it ended and I absolutely hated Emma Carstairs. Emma Carstairs basically is one of my least favorite female main characters, YA main characters ever, so that, that might also be 
reason why I wasn't the biggest fan of the Dark Artifices, even though I absolutely love, love, love Jules. And he's my biggest Shadowhunter baby right after Jem. He's like my favorite character right after Jem. So while we're at characters, let's talk about the main characters in this book. I once again enjoyed the side characters a little bit more. I really like Anna. Like, that's Please get more from Anna Lightwood. I love Christopher Lightwood. He's just so adorable. I absolutely love Thomas. I already kind of adopted Alastair, even though he's kind of a dick. I mean, he's not kind of a dick. He really is a dick. And there's absolutely no excuse for his actions. But um, I already fell in love with him and I already adopted him. So what can I do? It's just, that's the way it is. And our main characters, I think I like James so far the most among the Herondales. He's less of a tormented soul. He's kind of a tormented soul, but he also kind of has more of a reason to, to be a tormented soul. Because, yeah, I mean, he does have a demon grandpa, so... That's not amazing as a shadow hunter. He is judged a lot for that, so I get why he's a little bit tormented, but our main tormented soul in this book is his parapetai Matthew, and uh, I don't like him, which is explained in Ghost of the Shadow Market, but I like him, but I also like, kind of don't like him. And then Cordelia Carstairs isn't a Tessa, so I don't like love, love her. However, I did really enjoy reading from her point of view. I find she's an engaging main character and she's definitely way, way above Emma and definitely also isn't as annoying as Clary. So yeah, I do do really enjoy the characters in this book overall. The romance I was surprised by because when I started the book, I kind of was like, eh, not really interested in the romance. I'm not really reading this for the romance right now. However, by the end of the book, I did really ship it and they're really cute together. And I won't say who it is, even though it's really obvious once you start the book, but I still don't want to say it in this review right now anyway. So yeah, I did kind of enjoy the romance, although it did have one of those annoying things of the male character always telling the female character how incredibly brave she is, even though she's not doing that much outstanding stuff and you're just like she's doing everything everyone else is doing as well why why are you telling her all the time that she's oh so brave like kind of along the lines of chase always telling clary how brave she is even though she did exactly the same things izzy did or was incredibly stupid so that's kind of a pet peeve of mine and yeah, I think that was it already for my review review. I do not have that many thoughts on this book, funnily enough. So I'm actually quite happy that the discussion around this book arose when it did yesterday, because now I have a lot of stuff that I want to talk about surrounding this book, even though I do not feel it's even worth responding to the tweets that were sent out, because like, it's so stupid at this point, but it did really annoy me, so I want to talk about it. And I didn't want to rant on it on Twitter because I do feel like I can't properly rant on Twitter. Because like you have a tweet and you have a certain set of characters that you have and it's just I'm very long-winded sometimes. But before I get into the negative stuff, let's just appreciate how accidentally my nails absolutely beautifully match this cover. I kind of love it. But anyway, for those of you who aren't on Twitter a lot, um, there was a thing that happened yesterday where someone complained to Cassandra Clare that there's too many LGBT characters in this book because out of like 12, 13 characters that are main characters and main side characters where I would say, okay, there are characters that have like bigger speaking roles, so to say they say more than just one or two sentences, like almost half of them or six of them are part of the LGBT community and that wouldn't even be realistic today and it's definitely not realistic for 193 and they would understand why Cassie Clare does it but it's just so forcefully and also it cheapens the story. Um, I 
don't know what the exact words were anymore that were used and I'm too lazy to go and search for those tweets if they haven't deleted them already because they got quite a lot of hate on for those tweets, understandably. And by the way, a lot of people will say this is like book Twitter drama, but I personally don't consider that as drama. A lot of people say that book Twitter has a lot of drama and most of the time it's concerning stuff like racism and bigotry. And I personally don't consider it a drama. I consider that very, very understandable grievances on side of the minorities that are like hurt. So yeah, just to throw it out there right now. And the first reaction of a lot of people was, this is a fantasy novel. Why the fuck are you upset about gay people in a fantasy novel when there's fucking demons? Like sure, you can suspend your disbelief enough for demons, but not for gay people in 1903. And that's my first reaction as well, but then I think about it and it kind of upsets me to think about things like that because basically what you're doing is you're putting LGBT people, no matter in what time, on the same level as dragons, fairies, vampires, and one of those things definitely exists and the other definitely does not. So can we please stop comparing LGBT people to vampires and fairies? That would be amazing. Because we're not. <laughs> um, so yeah, the second thing I'm upset with about that is the whole story of LGBT don't exist uh, in 1903, as if they're like a new and amazing invention or whatever which they definitely aren't and they definitely existed and um, the only reason why we think that they didn't exist is because history wasn't just whitewashed and male washed or whatever you want to call it it was also very much straight washed i have to admit i'm not very well read in queer history it's not something that i've generally read or heard a lot about but um i still even though it's not something that i actively go searching for I still find instances of stories of women or men living together, of women living as men where they're in the history books as this was a woman and this woman lived as a man, where you think like, no, like everything around the story of their life, the first thing that comes to my mind would be that they're transgender and not that they're a woman living as a man. And of course, now we cannot like definitively say they were transgender and I don't think that's fair to say of anyone, but I would still say in history books that like, don't assume one thing or the other. Like for example, I read once about the first surgeon or one of the first surgeons who successfully did a C-section. I think that's what it's called. Like when you have to operate on a pregnant woman to get the baby out of a womb. And this surgeon was discovered after their death to have had a woman's body. And the story that was made up around that was like, okay, there was a woman who couldn't become a surgeon because at the time it wasn't allowed for women to attend university and become surgeons. So they started living their entire life, both private as well as public as a man and had in their will that their body should just be covered and no one should look at their body and they just should be wrapped in a sheet and like that be like put into the casket and buried and please no one look at my body and historians decided no this definitely couldn't have been a transgender person but this person was a woman who lived as a man so as you can see, LGBT people have existed throughout time and it does the community a disservice to say it hasn't been so. Also, even if you said, okay, it's unrealistic that they're all just out and about happy and merry in 1903, isn't like that in a story. There's one person among the six people who belong to the LGBT community who is out and who is proud of who she is, everyone else is basically suffering. So yeah, 
don't understand where you get that from that everyone's just out and about and by the way i saw as an argument against that that the shadow hunter community is more progressive which i would say no they're not <laughs> when even alec lightwood in 2008 still has troubles coming out so i would say that as far as i gathered the shadow hunter community actually is quite old-fashioned maurice lightwood was one of the first like generations of shadow hunter women who were allowed to be like on the same level as men who were allowed to attend the academy who didn't need to just cook and stay at home cordelia and lucy are told that they shouldn't become parabot high and that women don't become parabot high so i do not get where people get the whole shadow hunters are progressive thing from and i think it's completely fine to have your main characters not be bigoted and idiots and to have your main character be like yeah hey i'm cool with you loving whoever you want to love and then the last thing I want to say about the cheapens the story deal. Um, that's also just so random. And I would actually say the only way LGBT inclusion cheapens the story is if you then have a main character, a main romance that's straight. Which, by the way, don't worry, all your main romances are still cishet, so like, chill out. But anyway, the only way I think LGBT could cheapen the story if you then, and I don't say that this isn't this book, like, it, at least I didn't get the feeling, but when I thought about it, that just kind of thought popped into my head. The only way it could cheapen the story is if you then have a main romance where one character is only like complaining about unrequited love where their best friend can't even come out to their parents and can't even be open about who they love, so like get your priorities straight one of those things is definitely definitely existentially more threatening than the other and the last thing i just want to say is can we stop praising cassie claire for putting representation in her books because i wished that she was kind of the baseline and praising her for having lgbt representation in her books and having a lot of lgbt representation in her books when her main couples are still cishet which by the way nothing against that uh, i think cishet couples have the same rights as other couples or however you want to say that but it should be the baseline. It's like praising a man for accepting a no when he comes onto you. Uh, it's like, this, this should be normal though. Like, when did we stop seeing something as normal? Although I guess we have to start seeing it as normal. Although the thing I have to give Cassie Clare credit for is that she has more than just the, my big brother slash big sister is, homosexual uh, trope, which I'm getting tired of, a lot of Cruel Prince and the Curse to Dark and Lonely. So she puts a lot of representation in her books and it's great that she does, but can we, instead of praising books that have cishet main couples and just happen to have a lot of representation, which should be normal, can we instead praise books that actually have representation in their main characters although at least this time one of the main characters is half persian so like not white although i think persians are still caucasian but like not white white if you get what i mean so yeah i think that was all i wanted to say tell me in the comments down below what your thoughts were on chain of gold and also on the whole lgbt issue because i'm just really tired of this whole issue and I actually did make a video on LGBT representation in fantasy, I think. I'm not sure if I still agree with all the points I made in that video, but I will still leave it linked down below and up there, just in case you want to watch that. It was quite some time ago that I made this video. I still had long and flowing hair, although not really. I had like this long hair. But anyway. That was it for this video. If you enjoyed this, please give me a thumbs up and also maybe subscribe. All the links to my social media are in the description box down below, so go and check those out, and I hope I'll see you soon. Bye!